marketing providers. And um, we were going to run into an even worse lull in leads. And that's my, that's my primary responsibility is to, is to sell jobs so that my wife can handle the actual production side with, uh, with all of our subs. So I was praying. I'm like, oh, God, please just, like, provide me some sort of resource here. And literally within, within about, uh, well, within one day, maybe about 12 hours of me, I had two different painters in my area reach out saying, hey, Brad, I got these big exterior jobs that I am not going to be able to get to. We are so backlogged on our other jobs, and I don't have the crews you have. Would you be willing to just take these jobs and do them? I don't need anything in, re in return. I just, I just need the customers to be taken care of. So that was $60,000 worth of projects, just like, boom, just like that, that were delivered to me with that that service the customers and do a good job, right? So that was, that was answer to prayer number one. Well, because we have 35 painters, we're burning through these projects uh, very, very quickly. And so I... Uh, I, I, I reached out to a buddy who I knew was another prayer warrior. And I said, Hey man, if you're praying today, just pray for one word, just pray for yes. I had all these estimates that had gone out and it wasn't getting a lot of responses. And so that was, uh, that was yesterday morning uh, around 10 AM. And between yesterday and today, I've had uh, $55,000 worth of projects. Say yes. The so seven yeses simply by, I, I firmly believe um, yes, I did the due diligence in doing the estimates, and we have a professional system, but it, it's like God has blessed us. It, it's like every time I think I need leads, God says, "Oh, bro, you don't need leads. Here, just take these jobs." Right? You don't. You don't need. You don't need more of this. You actually need this. And I'm going to bless you with even more, like way more extravagantly than you're even asking for. You don't need leads. I'm just going to give you jobs. So it's been it's been really fun to see. It's been fun to bless my crews and keep them working. Everyone's making money and our customers are ecstatic. So uh, I thought that was a really cool thing that happened this week and um, wanted to share it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, who's got uh, anybody want to volunteer with a business tip? All right, Jason. Thank you. By the way, Bradley, wow, thank you for sharing that. Awesome, awesome stuff. It sounds it sounds like uh uh you know, prayer's your secret weapon. <laughs> I love it. I love it. You, one of the things you know, on the whole idea of leads, it's easy when you start growing your business to become a lead monster because, you know, we we can say that lead, leads are like the, you know, the the blood or the oxygen that the that, that the business needs to continue, uh, you know, selling and such. And we, we get it. It's easy to get into this cycle of constantly uh, trying to get more leads to the detriment of the leads that we already have. And the, uh, uh, the best leads that, that, that we have are the leads we already have in a way. Okay. And for instance, on our end, um, let's say my, my uh, uh, salespeople go out, they give them a price and for whatever reason they don't close the deal we have a system called called rehash where we uh, proactively call those people back and and try to figure out what happened and why we didn't close the deal and we uh, reissue those leads to uh, one of my senior people or my sales manager who will go out and meet with them again and our uh, highest value our net sale per lead issued so to say uh, is those leads is higher than the initial leads. And too many companies, if they don't close it right away, they just, you know, oh, they're, you know, they're, they're, uh, uh, they're just price shopping or something like that. And so if you have a, if you have a way to maximize uh, your existing leads, then th that's just one way is to rehash the ones that you didn't close. Because chances are, we know industry statistics tell us that, that if they called you out, they're gonna buy from like 70% of those people are gonna buy from someone in the next 12 months. So why not get another up at, at bat with the same with the same homeowner? Awesome, Jason. How do you get those people to get you to come back out? Like, what's that? What's that script look like? Okay, so it's uh, it's something. It, it starts off as a as a customer service call, you know, and we, we first of all we and we genuinely want to know that our sales team, you know, did they show up on time? Were they kind and courteous? All of those things. We ask some basic questions. And, uh, and, 
and, and most most times than not, they're very complimentary of our sales team. It's very rare that they're not complimentary. And we'll we'll ask the question, wow, it sounds like sounds like you liked Joe and sounds like everything went really, really well. Uh, but I don't I don't see you I don't see you signed up with this or on the calendar. May I ask why? And we find out why. Well, it, it all typically it's always going to come down to the price. Okay. If 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 my guys did a good job, the, the hardest thing to do the best job on is building the value. Okay. So if they've gotten everything else right and they just didn't build the value, then it, it goes something like this. Uh, well, is this something you're still looking to get done in the next 60 to 90 days? Oh, wow. Okay. Well, that doesn't give us much time to earn your business. Uh, Torlando, may I make a suggestion? Um, if there's anybody uh, here that could ensure that we've gotten you the very best price we could, that's going to be AJ, my sales manager. Um, may I make a suggestion? Why don't I have him stop by and meet with you tomorrow at 2 or 4 p.m.? Let him, it, he just needs 30 minutes to review the whole scope of the project and just see, hey, maybe we missed something. Hmm. And people are very receptive. I didn't run the exact script on that, but people are very receptive to that. Got it. Very cool. Very cool. Thank also, you. Oh, by the way, by the way, typically he doesn't go out and sell the job for less. Typically he cuts <laughs> on and it comes back with a higher price tag than the initial guy had. Sure. Wow. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Bradley. Thanks, Jason. Okay, so let's let's move into the the topic of our discussion. Um, Kayla, you're you're uh, you are you are the representative, right? Yes, I'm the representative for Final Touch Painting. I'm our new marketing director, so I'm the one who's in the weeds trying to figure out how to work Facebook advertising and posting and all of that. Awesome, awesome. So this is a this is an open discussion. This is a time for everybody on this call to kind of do a group think and, and answer this question. Um, and and I'll start off with uh, with with my what my strategy has been. Um, you know, I I am uh, just for for my you know to give people my background. Um, I uh, was a, was a paint contractor uh, very early on in in my career. I, I started uh, the business when I was in college at the age of twenty three. Uh, showed up to my first estimate on a bicycle with a backpack of supplies and uh, <laughs> won the job, but uh, it went so sideways. Oh my gosh, I, you know, I didn't make any money on that job, but that's how I started. And um, I ran that company for, for a long time. And then in, in 2020, um, I took an opportunity uh, to run sales and marketing for a, a, a software company. Um, that company was uh, fortunate enough to, to exit. We sold to a, a much larger company. Um, I ran uh, from there. I, I, I was a CMO at another software company for a short, short time before deciding to come back into painting with a new brand. Um, during that time, uh, well, what I'll say what my old strategy was is I really tried to just be present with anything and i was sharing a lot of articles to like interior design blogs and this that and the other and and honestly that wasn't really working as a social media strategy but this time around um i started the company locally um with my brother and we are on uh, a, a war path to to spread uh nationally uh we've got a location starting in louisville and i'm recruiting in other cities now um uh, but when I started locally here in Bloomington with my brother, the thing that we uh, got a comment on all the time was how long, how young he looked. And he's he is young. He's 22 years old. Um, but the, the genes in my family are such that uh, a lot of us look younger. I probably look the most like my age. Uh, but if you saw my dad, you would think that we are the same age. And so <laughs> there's this, my brother just looks young. And, uh, and that was a hurdle. People, you know, would, I'd, you would send him to a job and people would say, man, he's really young. Does he know what he's doing? And, and they would be hyper vigilant about the quality and, and all these things. And, uh, and so I said, I don't, I don't know how else to overcome this problem other than helping people know exactly what they're getting before they call. And so we're just gonna turn the camera on you and and just show you painting houses we'll do short clips put them on facebook 
hopefully that will help them feel confident about you doing the work seeing as they perceive you to be so young well that was my hypothesis um i did it and now it's at the point where people when they call they'll be like is miles coming to do the paint because i i want him right they, they don't care about the age anymore they want him and and so video is our strategy on facebook um and here's and here's what we do i i, I drop by the job sites uh mostly there to just give the guys uh, uh gatorades and and say say good work i'll do a little bit of quality checking and a little bit of extra training while i'm there but mostly i'm just there to capture some video of them doing of them doing the work and then i post it to facebook and then my strategy for how to get get visibility because it is a new it is a new company and so there's not a lot of facebook followers uh our visibility when we post organically is exceptionally low and so I do have a, a paid strategy just to get visibility. I don't treat personally, I know a lot of people do this, but personally, I do not treat Facebook as a lead generating tool. I treat it as a brand tool. And so what I do is I, when I post the, uh, the video, um, I, I open up the Google ads manager, or I'm sorry, the Facebook ads manager account. I don't do the, the boosted post thing. Sometimes I experiment with it, but it, it doesn't give me as good a results as using the ads manager. Um, but what I'll do is I'll create a, a post engagement campaign and um, I target um, age, uh, location, and income, um, and sometimes interests like home improvement, first time home buyer, that kind of thing. But mostly I'm just looking at age, uh, location, and income level. And the point of the, the, the objective of a engagement pay, uh, campaign is to drive views and to drive likes. Uh, that's what I'm looking for. It's, it's a very low cost way to run a, a Facebook ad. And what it does is it builds the social proof. So for an account that has 200 Facebook likes, um, we're able to get 10,000 video views per video we're able to get 30 to 50 likes, uh, several comments. Um, and then when I'm posting it, I make sure to turn on the call to action for send a message. So here's, here's the trick, okay? Once you do that, once you get a good amount of views and engagement on it, then you turn that campaign off and then you turn on a send a messaging campaign where, where you are going to run the same uh, post, you, you click existing post, you run the same ad and you run it to run messages. And what happens is people see in the feed as they're just kind of scrolling through on, on you know, uh, when they're bored, they see a post that has high engagement, a lot of views, a lot of social proof, and then they click that send, uh, send message button and, uh, and, and we, we convert them into a lead from there. Um, and, they're, and they're usually asking for ballpark pricing or to get an in-home estimate. Um, a great example of where this worked out really well is uh, the other day I, I had just yesterday I had lunch with a with a decorator who has um, they have six painting projects that they're doing simultaneously right now and they cannot find finer, find painters for the life of them. Uh, they they responded to that send a message ad, um, but then they also got a uh, a door hanger in the area that they lived, and so that real world and mixed with the digital. Uh, you know, lent them to call me and uh, we set up an appointment. And uh, now, now not only are, are we going to supply uh, painters for them, but um, I, I'm going to coach them on their business because they got some, they need some help on that. <laughs> so that's, that's my strategy in a nutshell. It's pretty low cost um, and it's, and it, and it does generate leads. Those, those messages, uh, they, the messages get started for, uh, I think it's about $14 a message. And uh, and a good amount of them convert into to appointments or at least a ballpark price. All right, the floor is open for everybody else. What else? What are what are you guys doing in Facebook? What's your strategy? Don't everybody answer at once. <laughs> um, I can I can go. Uh... So I, I'm Burgess. I'm the owner of uh, Paint Core Franchise. 
we have uh, we just started this year, so we have six pink core locations. But you know, without sharing my screen, I can kind of show you or tell you how we we do Facebook ads, which is probably our top you know lead gen. Uh, it's a little different than Torlando does. <coughs> Excuse me, but so we run we run ads with similar audiences that that Torlando mentioned. Uh, we do. We don't do messenger ads, although they do produce really well. We typically, it's a cold audience, uh, and the the link, you know, directs them off of Facebook onto the website where they can directly schedule a, an estimate with that location. With that being said, you know, once it's optimized, uh, you know, I'm just I'm just looking at the Data Studio here. You know, we spend on average, about twenty-four dollars a lead. Now, that's when I say a lead, that's a scheduled estimate, scheduled on-site visit for one of the salespeople. So, okay. yeah. So, there, I mean, there's there's other ways you could do it. Messenger ads, you know, you can get lower, you know, cost per acquisition. You know, to my understanding, we we've done some testing, but for our system and the way that we you know our sales pipeline it makes more sense to send them directly get scheduled you know sales team goes goes out you know pre-qualifies uh, there's a little bit of pre-qualifying on the form itself but so that's typically it uh, you know a typical budget of anywhere from two to four to five thousand dollars a month uh, as long as you know you're seeing that you know under thirty dollars per per acquisition you know, just scale it, you know, 20% at a time, and you're able to get those high dollar uh, value out of it. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Who else? What, what, who, who else is doing Facebook uh, advertisement? It doesn't have to be paid ads either. It could be your organic set, uh, strategy, um, you know, any, anything that you're doing in particular. May I just ask a question? For sure. Um, thanks. Uh, when it comes to your targeting, targeting the audience, um, I, I just started doing Facebook ads. I'm not a computer guy, really. Um, uh, I'd like to just get a little advice about how to how to do the market research in my community, just to know who to target and like how to how to how to put it in and in the actual system uh and you said you you actually go to these neighborhoods and you put door hangers down as well mm -hmm. uh, so so th those are some cool strategies but so so just 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 a little specification if you could please give me an idea of what do you do for age and and stuff like that yeah i i can answer i do i do 35 and up um, you know, I, I, I recognize that, you know, most of my customers are probably in the 40 to 60 range, but, um, but the, the, you'd be, you can't sleep on the 65 plus crowd on Facebook, uh, because they are there, uh, they're there all freaking day and, uh, and they, uh, they have, um, fixed income. And so if they can afford, uh, you know, if they can afford painting, then, uh, you know, then, then they're going to be great customers. Um, so we do have a good amount of, of older folks that find us on Facebook. Um, but yeah, I choose, I, I go 35 and, and up for my, for my age, uh, my age brackets. Okay. Um, in terms of location, uh, that that's really dependent on, on where you live because, um, you know, some folks live in a city where they just serve some of these suburbs. Um, whereas my city, you, it takes 15 minutes to drive across. So it's just a, it's just a real small town. And so I have a, I have a 15 mile radius. Um, it's real narrow. So, uh, yeah, there's only, I think our Metro is about 175,000 people, but realistically it's about 80,000 people in the city. So it's a very small area service area. Um, in in an area where you're you know a suburb i would be i would be targeting those specific suburbs and just doing a, a radius um around those areas okay. thank you 
appreciate it. Anybody have uh, uh, my, other comments? Oh, sorry, sorry go ahead. Uh, no, no, it's, it's, it's good. I was just going to say that my city is the same as yours, 15 minutes from my thing. So uh, that, what you said actually is interesting. Do you just stay with your own city or do you go outside of it? Uh, well, it's, yeah, I mean, our, my growth plan is, is to go multi-city. Um, so, you know, down in, down in Louisville is like our first, second location. And, uh, you know, that's a, that's a different strat. Louisville's kind of interesting because, um, you know, the New Albany, which is in Indiana, is just on the other side of the, uh, of the river. That's also kind of in range. And, and, you know, my painter down there, he, he, while he lives on the Louisville side, uh, there are some parts that, like New Albany in Indiana is actually closer than some parts of Louisville. So it's, you know, I just, what I do is I, what I do is I uh, have, what I've been doing is I've been pulling up um, in Google search. I'll just do like an image search for, um, for like, uh, like average household income map. Like that's what I, that's what I'll type in. It's like income map for Louisville and it'll show kind of a, kind of a heat map of where the money is. And those are the areas where, you know, where the money is, that's kind of where I want to be, you know, kind of targeting. Uh, but then if I'm recruiting, I actually have to do a, use another map that's, you know, based off of the average income. And, and I have to, search for somebody who's a, a lower in the lower income bracket you know in that 50 to 40 35 to 45 fifty thousand dollar range uh because those are the people that would be able to live off of the you know their cost of living is a little bit lower and so they could live off of the the wage of a the salary of a painter whereas if i were trying to recruit where we paint i wouldn't be able to you know afford people who are earning two hundred thousand dollars a year you know? so, <laughs> so you kind of have to I, I like using those maps to to kind of figure out the locations any other comments to jordan's question hey this is maggie um in nashville um i think that's a great question jordan and i think a super good business exercise to do would be to look back on your past customers and create a perfect customer profile. Um, obviously where you live is going to dictate what that looks like. Um, I mean, I would argue 25 to 35 age people is a huge part of our market here in Nashville because it's a young professional city. And so, you know, look back on your past jobs, what jobs were profitable, what jobs went well, what jobs, um, were quote unquote the best for you for the year and then what were those customers and then you can target your demographics and play around with it a little bit that way as well okay thank you maggie uh, i have a question for burgess so burgess um you you were talking about um reaching out to a cold audience and and uh trying to get them to uh follow a you know, follow a, a landing page link. Um, what does your content look like? Yeah. So I guess I should start with, uh, we, you know, we do interior, exterior. Now this is residential repaint ads. So interior, exterior and cabinet, high end cabinet refinishing, like, like most painting companies at this point, I would, I would imagine. Um, but as far as you're referring to the creative itself. Yeah. Yeah, so it's usually just the absolute best photo you can find of whatever the services that you're you're marketing towards. For example, if it's cabinets, uh, I'm looking at one now that actually has four cabinet photos in one, and then right over the top, um, we always do an offering. So for us, it's you know three hundred dollars off a, a cabinet refinishing project. I think with when you're you know targeting cold audiences like that, you have to offer something otherwise you're, you're not going to really get any clicks you're not going to get any conversions out of that um that you know, we also have branding campaigns that for example it'll have you know a large photo of, of our entire company and, and all the vehicles and and things like that so you'll get some general you know painting estimates out of that as well uh typically well actually around 27 dollars a conversion so that 
that's doing pretty good for a, a branding campaign just directly off of a cold audience. Um, but as far as, you know, the audience go, we don't restrict Facebook a lot when it comes to, you know, looking at, uh, you know, homeowner interest and, and things like that. We do kind of stick with age. Uh, that's typically about it, age and location. And then we allow Facebook to optimize over the course of weeks and months. And, and they seem to do a better job as far as optimizing rather than us restricting the audience. And then they don't have as much to optimize too. Mm. That's a good point. I, I think I'm going to try that. Uh, who else, who else does? Oh, go ahead. Does anyone do like video or like carousels or other types of graphics for their creative when it comes to Facebook ads? Or is it mainly, are you guys just using like a picture, like a before and after picture, obviously like Bridges said, like a, high, a really high quality photo of a project that you've done? We use a, we use a carousel, five images. Okay. Yeah, so we, we made a small tweak, like I think six-ish weeks ago and it switched to something we weren't doing a ton of facebook but i was just doing simple like boost boost a post send messages we would get a ton of leads and literally didn't close any of them uh for the majority of the year and we would just kind of do that sparingly every once in a while see if we get anything and we made a small tweak to where instead of uh, send messages we just set up a lead form um uh, as first name last name phone, email, city, state, zip, tell me a little bit about your project. And on Facebook versus uh, going to a landing page and then switched uh, kind of the, uh, you know, the, the boost a post part to a carousel of just five really good images for whatever we're doing. So most of them have been focused on exteriors. Okay. So we've done five exteriors. We run 15% off for all of our different marketing. So 15% off is on the headline at the bottom of the image. And then at the top, it's like uh, something like freshen up your home and enjoy 15% off you know, the entire project. Uh, if you schedule your estimate this week, something like that. And it's that little switch has gone from not closing anything to it's our highest ROI, at least lowest, one of the lower volumes still, uh, okay. but highest ROI uh, campaigns that we do. Okay. So. Do you have an idea of like what, I mean, what do you think it is about that change that made it convert more? I think the, uh, the, the lead part is pretty, okay. it's heavily qualifying somebody, but the funny part is we get almost the same volume. You know, we would run that boost of post and spend 300 to 500 over five to seven days and probably get five to seven messages and they just wouldn't go anywhere versus now we get five to seven leads and it's four to five really really solid estimates and we close one or two okay. uh, almost every time we've done that every week for six weeks now and it's like clockwork almost okay. so we're trying to trying to see if that scales up if we can do multiple of those or, or increase the budget and does it still roi at the same level but uh at least then it takes Jamie cut off towards the end there, but he looks frozen. Oh, you're back. You cut off uh, towards oh, the end. Man. That's all right. What, <laughs> what, was the, what was the last thing that you said? Uh, it was just basically it's simple to do. Um, same, you know, same same amount of leads, there's higher quality, and we've been converting, you know, closing one or two and getting like four or five really good estimates each time. We're just trying to get that scales up if we can spend more on it. Got it. So, all I, right. I, uh, I have a pretty good tip. Sorry, I just thought of it. Oh. Um, <clears throat> something that really helped us out uh, in a big way, and most people probably already know about it, is just utilizing the Facebook ad library to look at your competitors uh, for you know content inspiration as well as creative inspiration. So, that's probably been the biggest win for us uh, when you can see all of your competition, which ads they're running you're able to kind of really see what works and, and, and in some cases, what doesn't work. Very good, very cool. Uh, Ty, you've got your hand raised. You wanna unmute yourself? Yeah, I have a question for Jamie. Um, you mentioned about the 15% off discount. Um, 
I haven't been doing discounts, um, try to stay full price. Um, but in our market out here, I'm out in Denver, South Denver, very competitive. Um, it seems like we're losing a lot to a lot of heavy discounters right now. So I'm going to start a campaign here shortly, running to 15% off. I've tried 10, didn't really see the move to needle. But Jamie, are, are you baking that 15% into your bids? Um, or are you taking a, a slight margin hit on those jobs? So we started this in like Marchish time frame, and we did it for two different reasons. So one, we knew we were going to spend a lot on direct mail and we wanted to have a good offer there. The the bigger reason of most, because I was pretty heavily against discounting just off the the integrity of it or, or however you want to phrase that. Um, right. Just didn't feel like we needed to drop our price. We just needed to you know create more value and things like that. But uh, we were producing at like $97 an hour but our win rates were like low thirties and I wanted mm -hmm. to even that out a little bit. So I wanted to produce closer to $80 an hour and win 40, 45 or something percent. And just baking that 15% discount in there made both of those two things happen for us. So okay. that, that was the bigger reason is just kind of level out our number a little bit and be closer to where we wanted to. And then gives us a strong offer in direct mail. And we use that for Facebook ads and, any other paid ads we do now everybody else gets the same discount so you know if somebody comes organically through google you know our, our estimators come up with why they get that discount or, or use it to create some more urgency or something but that prevents the uh hey we just finished a job and on the last day we got this mailer for 15 percent off you know thing come up so that's what that, we just do that across the board for everybody okay so you aren't you aren't baking that in because the thing that I, I get worried about at baking a discount in is all of a sudden, say they don't accept your offer on the spot, then all and they're getting other bids, and all of a sudden yours is you know fifteen percent higher uh, than your than the competition. So um, yeah, I think right now I think you know we're starting to see kind of inflation, the economy kind of take its toll out here. Um, I was on a project yesterday where another painter came around with some door hangers and was offering thirty five percent off, and I was pretty shocked by that. Um, so yeah, yeah, typically, like you, you know, said, I, I uh, kind of held full price forever, you know, kind of integrity and building a brand, but uh, need to start dabbling in the discount game. Yeah. You know, Ty, I uh, I just had a conversation on on the Paint It podcast with uh, uh, my advisor, Roger Lee, um, and we were, we were talking, you know, about, you know, the concerns with inflation and with, you know, the slowdown in the economy. And, you know, one of the things, one of the strongest points that I think that he made was that, you know, the, the worst thing to make a, a, a bad situation worse is to respond with fear. And, you know, if, if you think that, I mean, the, the irony of this is that inflation is caused because of everybody having so much money. And, you know, so in business as well, people are buying. So, the, the fact that they're buying and, and things are going well is actually what's causing prices to soar. And as a result, it's become, it's unsustainable. And so the Fed is, is, is tempering with uh, interest rates in that to intentionally slow down the economy um, so that pricing doesn't keep going higher and higher. The worst response that we can do to that is think, oh gosh, we're about to go towards a recession. I got to keep everybody busy. And so I have to lower my prices and all, and what that does is it, it, it just, it makes you go back down to like, you know, break even pricing and, and you're not, and you're not making enough. So, so the worst thing that you can do is see that flyer and think, Oh gosh, I have to, I have to match that now. Like, don't do that. That, that hysteria is what causes a, an economic slowdown, which is a correction and, and a, and a healthy thing for the economy rather than you know a full recession or even going down to a depression because everybody's panicking uh you know be, be, because of it um what i what i prefer to do in terms of discount i don't mind a discount only because i know that people love discounts um what i tend to do is i offer the discounts on the paint as opposed to the labor and and so you can because we're you know we negotiate pretty good prices on the paint um you know i can i can on select product lines i can you know, give 30, maybe even 50% off of something like super paint, but then upsell them duration or emerald at a list price. But if they're getting 30% off paint 
and they can get that, you know, it, it, it feels like they're getting a deal and it, 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 and it is still attention grabbing because they're like, whoa, 30% off, um, but it doesn't hit your bottom line in the same way as, as discounting labor does. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah and, and I don't, I, I'm, I would never go 35% off. I have a tough time going 15 or 10. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's great advice. I did this in that podcast as well. Yeah, yeah. Cool. and but on that note too, when Torlando's talking about the inflation and it being because people have more money, it's kind of a yes and no to that because the the reality is that the reason that we're hitting a recession right now and people are getting really really price conscious is because the index for everything in terms of what costs are are rising across the board. So obviously the dollar is not going as far because the true costs of things are growing up so substantially. So that's one of the areas where when we talk about discounting rates and discounting prices, I start to get a little bit anxious on behalf of people because I think it's really easy to get caught up into the trends of what you see other people being really reactive to because people are starting to slash prices because of the fact that they're seeing drops in leads or they're seeing drops in conversions because the market is more price sensitive. But the reality is that your pricing, if it hasn't changed at all in the last 12 months through the last 18 months, your profit margins are already declining without discounting, like your costs to run the business are going up and that's a very real impact. So I would be very hesitant to kind of jump into the slashing price and being reactive piece, um, just like Torlando said, like responding with fear um, because across the board, you know, things are getting more expensive. And I would argue that everyone you're seeing right now that's running around slashing prices, 10, 15, 20, 30%, they're gonna be hitting, they're gonna be struggling really hard. Those businesses are not gonna be sustainable over the next two years. I was curious, Jamie. Oh, you be sorry, sorry, Jason, raise your hand. We'll come back to you, Morgan. Go ahead, Morgan. Finish, finish, Morgan. I actually just was going to ask you a question, Jamie. When you mentioned you, you, you pay, you have really good analytics, and you're paying really close attention to um, your close rates in terms of pricing. So I was curious. Whenever you've shifted your pricing down, has the increase in close rate jumping up to I think you mentioned forty or forty five percent was your goal? Um, the, with the close rate going up, has your volume of sales increased enough to compensate for the difference in margin on those? Or what are you tracking there? Yeah, I, I think overall the, the revenue increased because of it. And, and the price is still relevant. Like we could say 15% off and still be twice the highest person. So we're still definitely like higher priced. And then we also use subcontractors. So the margins actually don't change at all. Mm. So margins are still exactly where they were. And for us, it was just a way to uh get get our uh pricing a little bit more in line with where we wanted to uh and also use that as as a sales tool and again it was months ago it was in no relation to to what's going on right now so oh. yeah good question jason i think it's important that we differentiate what our selling price is versus what our calls to action in our marketing advertising materials are and the guys that are out there saying new 35% off, why are they doing that? They're doing that because they want the phone to ring, right? And, and it's true. When, whenever you, you know, bigger discounts are going to get more people to call. Well, you could say, well, those are going to be like super price sensitive buyers. Now you could say that there might be some truth to that, but you're more eye catching offers or what are, or, or what's going to get your attention. So, you know, the first thing you want your marketing to do, obviously we know this is we want it to grab people's attention. We want it to, if we're at the home show, we want them to stop walking by our booth. If, if we are in a coupon magazine, we want them to stop flipping pages. If they're sorting through their mail, we want them to stop tossing things in the trash for just a moment, right? We have to grab their attention and, and we can do that through photos or through offers or whatever, but that doesn't mean, you know, that's what your selling price is. Like for instance, Okay, what if you just doubled your prices and started offering a bigger discount? Okay, literally, some of those some people are going to pay the higher price and not get a discount. And we we get this idea that every buyer is out for the bottom dollar that we've got to be competitive with all the other guys that are out there. And it's just not true. There's other things that add value to your business and to what you're what you're doing for them than just the dollar that they're paying, you know. Look at the car you drive. Are you driving the cheapest car out there? No, there's a reason why you didn't buy the cheapest car out there. 
And we've got to be able to translate that into our marketing materials, into our sales process as well. I think that's such a good point. Like, and I, and I, and that applies directly to how I, how I deal with the, the, the paint products, you know, going back to that example of super paint versus duration, um, you know, the, the super paint that like the, if on my door hanger, it's 30% off paint and I'm offering 30% off of super paint. Uh, but when it comes to duration, it's only like a 10% discount, right? So like when, then when I get into the sale, then we have that conversation about what it, what is it that they actually want? And when they describe those things to me, it's like, oh, well, actually, I don't think that you do want super paint. You really should go with duration or emerald because, you know, you have a dog and you have kids and, you know, so on and so forth. And so I, I, that's just to validate what Jason is saying is that there isn't anything wrong, I think, with, uh, with throwing out a deal um, to, to get that phone to ring so long as when you get to the sale, you're able to customize and tailor the, the bid to what the people need. And I think in the, when you look at the lifetime value of that customer, um, you know, the, if, if you have a good strategy of getting that customer to come back, um there's they they've already chosen you and so you know the, your pricing the discounts those go you know those can go away and people don't bat an eye I, I had this happen about a month ago where we had a customer we did a small amount of work for her um and this and this was uh we were just adjusting our seasonal rates um to account for demand um and uh and you know she got in on a on the spring rate but then she called us back and we were in the winter we were in the summer and so the rate went up she didn't bat an eye to it. So, you know, if you look at that life, the lifetime, the full lifetime value of the customer, um, just because you get them to, to get the phone to ring on, you know, on a discount on, on uh, paint or whatever it is, um, that doesn't mean that your, your margins on your jobs are gonna be awful for the rest of your life, especially if you are good at reactivating customers and keeping them uh, engaged. Um, Morgan has a question. Do you want me to read it or you wanna read it? Or do you, or are you just, is it just a purely a, a message in the chat? No, I was actually curious. Like when we're talking about whenever we're designing promotions, I always kind of wonder about like the customer, the psychology of it. And so I was curious, like when you start, I'm, I'm a big proponent, if you're going to start offering discounts routinely in marketing, adjusting your pricing so your margin doesn't suffer is important. Um, but like when we're talking about people going around offering 30% or 35% discounts, how much of that, like as a consumer, is that appealing or does that make you kind of like stop and wonder a little bit? So I was curious if you were in the buyer's seat with any kind of product or any kind of service, if I'm coming around, like what's the number in your head that starts to make you wonder like- wow. Is it believable? Yeah. yeah. Like, is, it, is it believable? Yeah. You know, well, like for instance, the, the best offer we ever make, okay, our slowest, our slowest month is January. Okay, and oftentimes in January, we will literally uh, offer buy one room, get one for free. Max value of $500. Max value of $500, right? And if we actually sell that job, we really don't make any money on that job. But the chances of us going in there and selling two minimum rooms is unlikely. Uh, but it's a, it's a very appealing deal. And people understand that, that in our area, that this is the slowest time of the year and that's when they're going to get the best, the best deals. Right. But we're typically going to do three or five rooms or whatever. And so occasionally we do get one where, where we don't make any money on it. Like for instance, th to, to talk about carpet cleaners to this day, carpet cleaners still advertise three rooms, $99. Well, I, I haven't checked the ads recently, but up until three rooms for $99. So you're telling me you're going to send a you know, $100,000 truck out there and two guys to, to go clean three rooms for $99. There's no way. Well, they will do it, but they're going to come. They're going to sell you Scotch Guard. Then they're going to, you know, your floor clean, your, your hard floor, your sofas, your stairs, all those extra areas. And they're counting on what they're trying to do is they're trying to get a service slash salesperson face to face with someone who has a need. And that's the point of our marketing is to get my salespeople face to face with a homeowner who has a need or want. Yeah. And, and I, I had a conversation with, uh, with Jason Shearer a couple of years ago and, uh, cause there was a lot of discussion about, you know, there were a lot, there are a lot of people on, on a, on a high horse about, 
um, not discounting and not devaluing the, you know, the, the integrity of our, our work and all this. And, and he was, and he told me quite frank, he was just like, look, uh, our, my guys work hard all summer long to, to make me money. The, the least thing that I can do is make them money in the winter. And, yeah. uh, and so he said, he's not above going and calling up a customer that, you know, they didn't close on the bid and saying, Hey, I've got an opening. I got to keep these guys busy. I'm willing to do it for this price so that I can keep these workers working. And so at, at some point, I think as a, as an owner, you do have to remember that, um, your primary goal here isn't just to make money, but it is to take care of your employees. And so sometimes you, you do need to do that. Now, again, going back to the earlier conversation about fear and, and, and anxiety about what's looming, um, you know, don't make those decisions based off of fear. Um, but, but if you, if, if you are making money all year round or, or you know, during the summer and, and you, and you've been responsible with your finances, um, you you should be able to confidently make those decisions and not only benefit your team but benefit the consumer in the process because uh, because you know fair prices and discounts do benefit them in a lot of ways. Jason, you got a comment? So I also want to differentiate that when we have a company promotion, there's a good reason why we have the company promotion. Now, when my salesperson gets in the home, they can't they don't have any negotiation ability. We have a price and we have promotions. Period. And so it's not like, hey, can you say, can you do it for two hundred dollars less? No, they can't mark it down. They don't have that ability. They can, they can give them any promotions that we have, and uh, they can give them, you know, uh, savings for cash or check, and and that's it. So I believe that anytime you're quote discounting, there really needs to be a justifiable reason or an exchange of value. And if like the conversation of, hey, it's a slow time. My guys have worked hard for me. I want to keep them. I want to keep help them put food on their table through the winter. It's valuable to me during this time to keep these guys busy. So I'm extending that to you, the homeowner. And so I'm going to get value and you're going to get value. It really needs to be an exchange of value because if you just start, you know, well, yeah, you know, 20, you know, 2,500, I'll do it for 2,250. All of a sudden that's where you really start to devalue because you're just dropping your price for no good reason. I think at the at the end of the day, though, the only thing that really matters is how you produce the job and what the margins end up being. So you could discount to anything if you could still produce it at a at a high level and, and give good quality and the customer's happy and the margins don't change. Like we we do those type of deals all all day long. Really. I think that's the I think that's the closest dollar is somebody that wants like five hundred bucks off the price that you're at. You know, if it doesn't if it's not gonna adjust the margins, I don't see any reason not to do that. I just think that's where that's where it's tricky is that a lot of people aren't always clear on what the margins are going into it on the price points. Like a, a lot of people are kind of hitting a moving target with that. So yeah, yeah, for sure. I like what you said, Jason, about the fact that you know you have promos that are very intentional, but it's very clear that the sales team doesn't have the ability to negotiate that because I think when it comes to like devaluing the concept of the work that's a really, really good angle of approach because promos and discounts that are seasonal and very specific as part of a marketing push, I think the market understands. But when you do find yourself or you have teammates in a scenario where they're wheeling and dealing on the floor with a homeowner, I think that starts to devalue the value because then the homeowner is like, well, we're just kind of playing a game here on this. It doesn't seem as, it doesn't seem as like strict and thought out. Right. Yeah. So on our end, 30% of our uh, projects are sold at what we call list price. So they're not all, they're not all discounted and 40% uh, are sold at our, uh, our standard, uh, uh, whatever our promotion, promotional price is. And we have some, we, all, we also do like roofing repairs. We don't ever offer any discounts of any sort on roofing repairs ever. It's just, that's a, an item we don't, we don't discount on that. So. Mm. Um, you know, Morgan, you mentioned uh, w one of your questions was just about the psychology um, from from what I gather and, and what I've what I've you know experienced um, a discount in a single digit um, doesn't move the needle. Um, so if it's less than 10 percent, if it's nine or five percent, that doesn't really move the needle. Um, mm -hmm. And, 
you know, I, I do think that there's a limit, like especially on labor. I think there's a, I think you can discount labor and materials differently. Um, I, I think if, if you're discounting labor heavily, um, that to me would send a red flag. Whereas, you know, you take Sherwin Williams uh, right now through, I think tomorrow, they have a, a deal going on of like 40% off on, on paints. And so, you know, I kind of trust a, a giant like <laughs> Sherwin Williams to know what they're, you know, what they're doing with, with discounts. Um, and, and it does make it hard, you know, when you're out there selling, you're trying to sell paint at list price. And then they are like, oh, we but on the commercial, they say it's 40% off. And so you might actually yeah. just have to like mirror their deals, yeah. you know, uh, maybe, maybe not, but you know, it's not a bad idea to to say, Hey, by the way, you know, uh, Sherwin's got a deal going on. Um, the other thing that I would say is that, uh, I've been really keen on seasonal rates. And so, you know, uh, you know, when you drive, when you get an Uber, you know, uh, for, for those who travel and use Uber, um, there are certain times of night where, where you have what they have, what's called surge pricing. It just means that there's high demand. And so the price goes up when the demand is up. It's, it's basic supply and demand. And so I really have no problem uh, it, it, even explaining, hey, we're in, our, in, we're in our busy season and so prices are a little bit higher here. Um, if you want a discount, then wait till the winter. Um, and then there's this thing called a reverse sale, which is in the uh, win early winter, early spring, you say, hey, we're adjusting our pricing uh, coming up in the next two months for uh, to adjust for seasonal demand. If you get on our schedule now, you can get it for this. Whereas if you wait, it's going to be this. And so uh, that creates a little sense of urgency, a little sense of scarcity. Um, but that's that's called the reverse sale is when you promote that there's going to be a price hike. And in terms of the selling psychology, something that's really big in the digital marketing space that I don't really ever see applied in, in the contracting space are like the timers on your website, the countdown timers. So if you're doing a reverse sale with like a seasonal promo that's going to expire, if you're pushing people onto the website, something that's promoting that seasonal sale that has a countdown timer to like when it expires really creates a sense of urgency. I don't really see that employed very often in our space, but it's a very, very solid. A lot of the people who work in the digital marketing space, if you go to anything that they're selling, they will have like five timers on their page. To get to we're we're going to be putting that on here pretty soon. There we're, you go. we're actually working on that right now. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, this has been a, a great conversation. We're at the end of our time. Uh, Kayla, do you feel like uh, you got a, a good amount to go on? You got some ideas? Yeah, I think there was some really good takeaways. It's cool just to hear how different people are doing it. Obviously, being new to the marketing, we wrestle with discounting and, and that. So it's good to hear just several different opinions on that as to if that's something that we do. We haven't done it yet. Um, so it's great just to just kind of take it all in. So thank you all for sharing your expertise and what each one of you does in your business and how you handle Facebook in particular. Awesome. Well, thank you everybody for joining and taking the time to be with us. Uh, I've had a good time. And, and so we'll do this again next month. And uh, so please stay uh, on the calendar invitation and, and come to the ones you can. If you can't make it, that's fine. Make the next one. But uh, until next month, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll see you guys. We'll see you guys around. Thanks, Torlando. Awesome. See you guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.